Well, Santa has been here and gone, and while he didn't pick up his decorations, he definitely did leave us a new chipset, or Intel left us a new chipset, or he deposited the chipset at Intel, who simultaneously released it worldwide instantaneously, and so everyone everywhere has now gotten KB Lake, and so everything is being released simultaneously. It's all Santa. You heard it here first. It's like, oh, it's a conspiracy. All these people are releasing videos on the same day. Santa. It was always Santa. I'm not really sure why Intel chose after Christmas to release KB Lake, but it is what it is. We're going to take a look at the ASRock Z270 Extreme 4. This is the first KB Lake motherboard that I got my hands on. We're running it with an i5 that I did all my testing with because, eh? So, yes, Z270. Give me the 30 second version. Z270, why should I want it? Well, it's really around peripheral connectivity. Between KB Lake and Skylake, you know, there's not really a lot of difference. In fact, if you follow this channel for a long time, uh, I've said things like, well, you go all the way back to Sandy Bridge, and in terms of instructions per clock, you're not really making that much of an improvement over modern CPUs. I mean, yeah, it's been a, an incremental improvement, so when you go 27 generations, by the time you get to KB Lake, it's really good versus, you know, Sandy Bridge, ancient Sa Sandy Bridge. But in terms of, like, Skylake versus KB Lake, it's like, oh, am I going to throw this out and upgrade? No, probably not. But KB Lake does give you some better peripheral connectivity and uh, honestly a lot of the improvement from Sandy Bridge to KB Lake has been around peripheral connectivity, better interface speeds, the move from PCI 2.0 to 3.0, better SATA speed, SATA Express, M.2, those kinds of things are where all the improvements are and Z270 doesn't seem to be any exception to that. The DMI interface on Z270 provides an additional four PCI Express lanes of connectivity for any peripherals that might be on the motherboard. And this motherboard doesn't disappoint. There are three M.2 slots. There's uh, two by 16 slots physical that are by eight by eight if you're gonna run SLI. Those are still wired directly into the CPU. But all of the other PCI Express connections are wired through the DMI. The DMI is the peripheral interface that goes into the KB Lake CPU. But by, by moving from 20 to 24 lanes in total on the uh, KB Lake platform, Z270 is able to provide better connectivity for peripherals for whatever vendors might choose. Now this particular motherboard has an AS Media controller, we'll cover that more in a minute, or USB 3.1, but it does support Thunderbolt, and so you can run combinations of M.2 peripherals and Thunderbolt and other connectivity, and this is a little bit cleaner of a solution than you have on some other motherboards, like with X99, where you get a 20 lane CPU or a 28 lane CPU, and depending on which CPU you got, different motherboard resources are enabled or disabled. Well, with KB Lake and Skylake, that's all done through the DMI. So it's it's almost like a PCI Express switch, but it's really designed around peripheral connectivity. So instead of other PCI Express that's wired directly into the CPU, the DMI interface is what handles that. And so you have a little bit you have a little bit more latency. It's a little bit different connection. Now, can you run by eight by eight by eight with this motherboard? No, but you can run by eight by eight by four like traditional motherboards but you still have all of your M.2 connectivity, you have your SATA connectivity and that sort of thing. Curiously absent, SATA Express. SATA Express is not something that really caught on, in my opinion. I do not see SATA Express on this motherboard. It does have two USB 3.0 headers on the motherboard, which is nice. And then it's got the Asmedia USB 3.1 at the back panel. Actually, let's take a look at the back panel and see what we're working with in terms of connectivity. So what have we got around the back? Well, we've got our PS2 combo mouse and keyboard port, and we've got two USB 3 ports below that. We've got VGA, DVI, and HDMI for the built-in graphics that you may be running with your KB Lake CPU. Then we've got our Asmedia USB 3.1 ports, one type A and one type C. We've got our Intel i219V Ethernet adapter. We've got two more USB 3.0 ports. Then we've got our 7.1 audio solution. Now this 7.1 audio solution is based around the Realtek ALC1220. So this is an upgraded Realtek codec over the previous generation. It is designed with a 120 dB signal to noise ratio. The sound solution is also known as Purity Sound 4 in the uh, ASRock material, but it is based around the ALC1220 Realtek codec. Also at the back panel, we've got our first M.2 slot. Now this M.2 slot is suitable for running, you know, a wireless AC adapter. And there are two cutouts for your wireless AC solution, two antennas uh, for your, your wireless solution. You could also run a wire out through the back panel if you wanted to do it that way, but this is designed for an M.2 uh, Wi-Fi Bluetooth combo adapter. Now in terms of ASRock features for this particular motherboard, it does have a 10-phase power design, power circuit, 
system. Uh, it does also have an external B clock provider. So if you want to do extreme base clock overclocking, you can do that because ASRock provides a base clock overclocker uh, on the motherboard to, for you to control that. And there's some control you know, in UEFI so that you can do your overclocking that way. In terms of PCI Express peripherals, um, you can run by eight by eight by four with three graphics cards in a crossfire configuration or by eight by eight for NVIDIA SLI. It does also come with the high speed bridge um, the high-speed bridge is what you need for SLI on, on modern NVIDIA solutions. Uh, it's just a, a change that NVIDIA has made with their with their new chipsets. You know, it's a fancy new bridge because uh, they need more bandwidth or whatever. Crossfire, of course, doesn't require the bridge. The by 4 connection in the bottom slot is through the DMI, though, instead of being wired directly into the CPU. So keep that in mind. You also have three PCI Express by one slots just above all of the 16 slots. Now, this layout is pretty smart. It'll let you run dual or triple height graphics cards. Um, it will let you run PCI Express NVMe. Bootable NVMe is supported um, on this platform as well as Intel Optane support. Optane is the new Intel technology, X point memory, all that stuff. Optane is supposed to be so much faster that it would be like going from spinning rust to SSDs. So we're gonna go from SSDs to this Optane thing and this motherboard supports Intel Optane technology. At least it says it does in the manual. I've never laid hands on it. I might have saw some Optane stuff on stage at Computex in 2016, maybe, don't know. Gonna have to play with it, gonna have to wait on it. Might have to bake a little bit longer at Intel, I'm not really sure. But <laughs> it is supported and it's bootable for the uh, the M.2 slot so you can run NVMe. And of course you can run PCI Express NVMe in the bottom slot, that's completely fine as well. So at the bottom edge of the motherboard, we've got our front panel audio connector, which is on the isolated part of the printed circuit board. Then we've got our Aura RGB LED controller. Then we've got our two Thunderbolt headers, We've got three USB 2.0 headers. And then we've got our front panel uh, RS-232 connector and our TPM header. We've got our front panel, you know, lights, switches, that sort of thing. And rounding around the front of the motherboard, we've got our SATA connections. There's our M.2 slot below the Z270 chipset, of course. We've got our ATX power connector and our two USB 3.0 front panel connectors. There's also a fan connector along the bottom edge of the motherboard. Now let's talk about the audio solution. The audio solution is based around a new Realtek chipset. At least I don't remember playing with the uh, Realtek 1220 before. It does have Nishikon 5 grade audio capacitors. It is designed with 120 dB signal to noise ratio. It has PCB isolation and all the stuff that we've come to expect from a, a well implemented sound solution for on motherboard sound. It does of course support Blu-ray audio and you know all that kind of stuff. It implements a TI NE 5532 premium headset amplifier for the front panel audio connector. That front panel audio connector does support up to 600 home headsets. And it also supports DTS Connect. Now the Asmedia USB 3.1 solution is an ASM 2142. So if you're looking to find out, you know, what, you know, is it Intel Alpine Ridge? No, you can get that through an add-in card that will give you Thunderbolt connectivity. Uh, and that would occupy the bottom by four slot, but that's what you need for Intel Thunderbolt connections. Now there are a total of eight SATA 3 connections, six of which are provided by the Intel chipset and two of which are provided by the Asmedia chipset. All of those are SATA 3 6 gigabit per second ports. Now as I mentioned before, there are two M.2 slots, one of which supports M.2s up to 110 millimeters in length. The other one supports M.2 up to 80 millimeters in length. There are two AMI UEFI BIOSes with multilingual GUI support. Um, so you've got a primary and a backup, and you can switch between them. Those are soldered on the motherboard. Now the motherboard does, of course, have four DDR4 DIMM slots. Now, KB Lake supports DDR4 2400 out of the box. It's not really an overclock speed. That's just sort of the bare bones, bare speed for KB Lake. Uh, this motherboard does support DDR4 3866, but 3866 is only on one DIMM. I don't have any DIMMs that are anywhere close to that fast, but I do have some DDR4 3200 DIMMs, and I was able to get DDR4 3200 to work in all four slots. So DDR4, 3200, all four slots with my KB Lake i5. Not bad, it's not bad at all. Now it does also support ECC unregistered DIMMs. However, you will not get the ECC function. So you can post and it uses it and it's fine and everything's good, but you're not gonna get ECC on the Z270 chipset even if you put a Xeon in there. You gotta have sort of the trifecta in order to get that. It'll boot with ECC memory, but it won't actually use it. I notice. Some people on the forum have been confused about that in the past, so I wanted to be explicitly explicit with that. So here we are booted into our Fedora 25 workstation uh, command prompt. This is the output of LSPCI. As you can see, the 
memory controller was detected, the Ethernet controller, the I-219V was detected, the audio device was detected. I'm not sure you can hear that, but you can kind of maybe hear the GNOME uh, pop, pop, pop sound. But it's working, so that's good. Intel support out of the box. Let's cat proc CPU info. Yeah, genuine Intel Core i5 7600K at 3.8 gigahertz. Currently clocked at 800 megahertz due to power saving, so that's good. Okay, now that we've got this installed, we're gonna run i7Z and see what we're working with as far as our CPUs go. So we can hear, well, we can see here that you know, our total speed, 3.7 gigahertz, 791, 3.8 gigahertz. Basically, that's right. It's slightly, slightly, slightly underclocked for stability, which is what you would expect from Intel. We can see the breakdown of what's going on with each of our four cores, the power state. You know, most of the time these are in C1 halt state, uh, and we, we see what our V core is, which is 0.69 volts, which is nuts. So let's give this thing a little bit of a benchmark. Let's do, uh, and here we can see that all four of our cores have hit 4.2 gigahertz on the turbo. And it'll stay there as long as the uh, CPU is within thermal and uh, power limits. We get a V core of 1.22. Now this is completely stock. This is a completely stock configuration that it's peaking at 1.22. We can see our temperatures are looking pretty good too. You know, we've got one core that's 46 degrees C. The other ones are 30, 31, 28. So that one core is, is you know, running a little warm, but not terrible, I guess. Okay, so here we can see that we're running on, on all four cores. We still have a turbo of 4.2, even though all four cores are in use. Now this is a little different. Some Xeons will actually give you more turbo boost when only one core is active. But in this case, we can see that all four of our cores are active. We're basically at 4.2 gigahertz, 4.209x for the multiplier. Uh, we are in C0, which is the, you know, means that the cores are running. All the V cores are 1.24 volts and our temperature is 50, 51, 49, 45 across the board. And this is with a, you know, a modest air cooler. So your temperature climbed up a little bit, 53 degrees C. But, um, you know, it's basically directly under the microphone. The fan really hasn't ramped up all that much. It's running like a champ. Are you a fan of fancy fan control? Because this thing has five fan headers. The fan headers are all smart speed control from the UEFI. There's a CPU connector at the top of the motherboard along with an optional water pump connector. Those can deliver one amp of power, which is pretty cool. Although you have to be careful if you're, you know, if you're pulling like one amp from all the connectors, that's not really supported. Your total draw there is gonna be 1.5 amps. There are two chassis fan connectors that also have smart fan control that uh, provide fan functionality, like the fan functionality in the UEFI. Uh, and then there's one chassis optional slash water pump fan connector that's four pin and also has um, speed control at the bottom of the motherboard. Of course, for power, it's got the standard 24 pin ATX power connector along with your eight pin CPU power connector. Now, so what about the design aesthetic and the overall, you know, look of the motherboard? It's really, it's nice. It's sort of understated. It comes by default with this sort of uh, accent blue lighting, but it is RGB and there is an RGB LED header control thing because apparently the market demands that. Um, you can control the, the color of the lighting because it is full RGB controller. Um, you have to run the software to, to configure that. You can configure some options in the software in terms of what you want for RGB color control, but by default, the controller comes with this sort of nice soft blue um, and this sort of soft blue lighting effect. Now I've got the motherboard powered off now. I'm not sure if you can see it on the camera, but there is kind of a nice blue glow um, on the power um, for the IO shield, as well as the uh, the CPU north bridge, you know, down here under the graphics card. I think you can kind of see it because there's a little bit of a shadow from the graphics card. It, it doesn't look bad. I mean, this, this design aesthetic where the core elements of the motherboard are basically black and white. You got RGB control. You can probably make that work with about any color scheme. So you've got some flexibility there. <laughs> I didn't sleeve the test bench cables or, or anything like that. So if RGB is your cup of tea, yes, the motherboard does have an RGB controller and there is an optional connector on the motherboard for hooking up an RGB LED strip. So what's the verdict? Well, in running about 24 hours in grueling burn-in testing on the test bench, the motherboard didn't really do anything weird. I was able to make it through a Windows 10 installation. Uh, Linux Fedora 25, also installed Fedora 25. Not really any problems. Kind of surprising, kind of not. I mean, it's a new chipset, Z270. Usually Linux is not on the bleeding edge for supporting things like that. But Kaby Lake is really just an incremental improvement over Skylake. So 
The sound solution worked, which was surprising because again, Realtek ALC 1220, but I guess it's backward compatible or Linux already knows that or somebody's on top of that or Realtek already contributed a patch to the kernel or I don't know, but it was fine. I was also able to use a Toshiba M.2 with the M.2 adapter on the board and it was completely fine. Windows 10, of course, was completely fine. There were drivers provided by ASRock because it's, you know, early release, whatever. Um, Speed Step and Turbo Boost 2.0 and some of those things maybe have been tweaked a little bit, but really, Cadby Lake's not really a lot different from Skylake. A little bit different in the lithography process. Little, little tweaks here and there for your settings. Honestly, the biggest thing is that, like Broadwell E, you've got the AVX tunability now in the UEFI. Um, I think I missed that on, on earlier generation motherboards, at least. The last time that I was really trying to overclock a chip, AVX was what was holding me up. I could get 4.5, 4.6 gigahertz out of the chip, if I recall correctly. But as soon as a program hit those AVX instructions, the machine was locked up, it was done. Well, with the AVX negative multiplier in the UEFI, you can say, hey, when you're doing an AVX workload, back off the CPU clock to something reasonable. And that's provided in the UEFI on the Extreme 4 BIOS. So good to know. Good, good that you can push the overclock ability just a little bit more if AVX is, is not your hangup. Previously, I think I'd advise just turning off AVX instructions, which you might not want to do if you're actually going to use those AVX instructions. But overall, it was a pretty solid board. That's Z270, KB Lake. KB Lake is upon us. If you ended up with one of these or you're thinking about getting one of these, come to our forums and discuss, hang out, share your experiences with other people. Good experience, bad experience, we want to hear both because, you know, too often people will buy stuff and you never hear from them again. It was like, it was great, everything was amazing. Come let us know in the forum. Or if you had a bad experience, come let us know in the forum because we must gather the data. It's for science. I'm Wendell. I'm signing out and I'll see you later. Banana.